One Saturday in 1905, in the city of Manchester, England, a factory worker by the name of William Hope set out to photograph a friend. Mr. Hope, an amateur photographer, had been through the same process many times before, and certainly nothing about this day was different than any other. Once in the developing room, something unusual happened. At first, he wondered if he had forgotten to clean the photographic plates. But it soon became clear what had taken place. The image of a woman had appeared on the photograph. Hope's friend recognized her immediately. It was his sister, who had died 12 years before. Mr. Hope believed he had photographed a ghost. In 1964, this man, Ted Sirios, came to the attention of a group of scientists and psychologists when he claimed to have taken photographs solely with the power of his mind. A series of experiments were conducted that confounded all those present. The photographs he produced were simply unexplainable. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. In 1874, Sir William Crookes, a scientist and member of the London Psychical Society, was investigating the spiritual medium Florence Cook. It was said that Miss Cook would enter a cabinet and materialize a spirit named Katie King. Though he believed he saw her with his own eyes, he was still not convinced that she and the medium were not one and the same person. To clear up his doubt, he opened the cabinet in which the medium worked. In his own words, I examined Katie with steadfast scrutiny until I had no doubt whatever of her reality. <laughs> Vernon Miller is a photographic expert from the Brooks Institute of Photography. In photography, light is reflected from or absorbed by the subject in the photograph, focused through a lens, and recorded on a light-sensitive uh, material, film, plates, emulsion. The film is light-sensitive, so any energy, any electromagnetic energy, can affect the film to some extent. So radiation from all of the, the various ways, x-ray, so forth, can affect the film. So you might not necessarily see the light that strikes the film. I've seen many examples of accidental ghost photography. Uh, I've seen very few, if any, actual examples of a process. Most of the, the ghost pictures that I've seen are uh, examples of double exposure techniques, where uh, one image was recorded against a dark background, and that image superimposed on a normally lit scene so that you can see the brighter image against the, the normal scene. Uh, this particular picture seems to be quite a production. This is not uh, accidental. The photographer wanted to achieve this effect. There are a few clues. The ghost image is quite bright against a darker uh, background indicating that he was illuminated some way that uh, would show him against that. We can see two or three images of the hand as it goes up the banister. Uh, many times there are other clues. Uh, the ghost scene will be lit artificially with a directional light, uh, as in this crucifixion scene. It appears that uh, these are miniatures that were lit artificially, and then the, the combined scene was done in daylight under a different light condition. Ever since the first photograph was taken in 1826, no images have been more surprising or more controversial than those reported to be ghost photographs. Experts will continue to disagree on a phenomenon that theoretically records the presence of entities that are invisible to the naked eye.
Attempts to cross the thin line between life and death have occupied man's mind for centuries. Perhaps photography, recording the subtleties of light and energy, can provide a glimpse into the other realm. William Hope, Sir William Crookes, and others were convinced this is so. This is known as the Armistice Photograph and was taken on Remembrance Day near the London War Memorial in 1923. It purportedly shows an entire battalion killed in the Great War and gripped the public imagination like few other photographs before or since. But the question of how these images got onto film is still in debate. Raymond Bayliss is a psychic investigator who has researched hundreds of ghost photographs. There are two main theories. One, of course, is that the origin of all psychic phenomena comes from the mind of an individual uh, operating through the subconscious. And the other main theory is that uh, the phenomenon itself is in some way instigated by a surviving spirit. I've taken part in some experiments that I believe were authentic. Uh, that is, that authentic uh, psychic photographs were taken. Now, I'm not going to call them spirit photographs because I don't know whether they're the product of a spirit or whether they're the product of an individual's mind or what have you, but nevertheless, I do believe that they were actually psychic photographs, that is, they were paranormal. Now, this is ordinary Polaroid film, four by five inches film, and it's, it comes in a light, tight envelope. Uh, it can be uh, utilized into any number of normal cameras by inserting it into a holder, a film holder. Okay, we insert the film in the back of the camera. And from this standpoint on, it is just like ordinary wet process photography. And I'll snap this picture and make a little demonstration for you. Now, in wet process conventional photography, there is a step in the dark room where the film is processed and the picture finally uh, printed, and Polaroid or instant photography has the advantage of having all of this done in front of you, so there's no chance for manipulation of the image uh, other than right here before your eyes. So in a few seconds, we can open this envelope up and examine the photograph that we just made. Here we have the image that we just photographed just now and a ghost-like image of another face that uh, was made uh, prior to the uh, exposure just at this time. I'm familiar enough with this process that uh, I would look at, uh, at any image with a great deal of skepticism. Many times scientists go into experimenters with blinders on. That is, they have become so biased due to prevailing views, uh, customs of thought, so forth, that they're no longer capable of actually examining uh, an experiment. They may, for example, take part in an experiment, admit that all of the controls were perfect, that there was nothing wrong whatsoever, uh, but then a few days later, they suddenly uh, find that their, uh, that their view is changing. They no longer can accept it, but this is not uh, this is not the result of thought. This is the result, as I say, of, of a prevailing bias. They simply cannot examine an experiment clearly. There have been spirit photographers that have produced real psychic photographs, and in my, uh, in my opinion, and they have also resorted to fraud. There have been some photographers that apparently uh, never resorted to fraud, or practically never. Bouguet was a very famous early spirit photographer one of the pioneers, you might say. He made uh, vast numbers of these photographs, some apparently, apparently real. But in 1875, Bouguet was put on trial for fraud by those who felt that the idea of photographing spirits was preposterous. Fraud could not be proved, and Bouguet went on to produce many more spirit photographs, some reportedly under rigid test conditions. I found the flower. Not all such cases were so bitterly fought. In 1917, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle came upon an incident that soon became well known throughout Europe. He reported that two young English girls, while playing in the woods near their home, believed they saw a gathering of fairies. They returned to the spot soon afterward and took these photographs. Skeptics pointed out the suspicious resemblance to several drawings done by Claude Shepperson to illustrate a poem entitled, A Spell for a Fairy. 
Episodes such as this tended to cast doubts on spirit photography. Natural cave formations in Southern California provide photographer Seymour Locks with fertile ground for picking up energies from past civilizations. Coming into the cave area, what I was uh, feeling was simply that it had been used by somebody. It was just a message that I was getting. There are energies in the earth, sometimes from water, sometimes from minerals, and sometimes from the presence of entities who have used this, because everything in nature has a memory. A rock, whatever, has a memory. And so I would assume that the energies in this area would have to do with the people who lived here at one time, the Indian people, whomever. But it has that kind of aura that but I would assume whenever I work with their entities around, because my supposition is that I'm assisted on the other side by people who create the imagery. He believes that his photographs provide evidence of unseen entities. More than 10 years ago, unexplainable images began appearing in photographs taken by Seymour Locks. After much investigation, he has concluded that he has mysterious assistance, and the strange glow apparent in many of his pictures is energy from unseen entities. This is really a beautiful configuration, and it, it's reminiscent of the uh, opening to the sky that you would uh, find in the mythologies of the American Indian. A psychometrist can hold an object and pick up Im images, sometimes vibrations, etc. A dowser can walk over a landscape and tell where the water or the mineral. Psychic photography, the, uh, the ability to pick up an image uh, is comparable to picking up a clairvoyant image or simply using another medium. Photography is a receptive vehicle because it is silver. It has a vibration already. Sometimes the image is impressed while I'm developing. Sometimes it's impressed while it's in the camera. You don't need a camera. You simply need some kind of sensitized uh, paper or film. The silver salts are a receptive vehicle. One of the most spectacular uh, series was with a, a woman, Jerry Isaacson, who at that time was living in Santa Cruz. And I uh, photographed her in a sequence of photographs in which she was doing a massage. And in the five frames that ensued, uh, she became less and less visible. My experiences have been that white light is projected from the healer and that they become transparent. Transparency and, and uh, a luminosity seems to be pre prevalent in those photographs I've made of the healers. In one remarkable photograph, a human face stares at us from another time and space. After a seance, I wanted to see what uh, I might pick up because I was still feeling, as I generally do after a seance, the room is very, very strong because you've been building the energy, so-called, in that environment. The so-called upper levels of consciousness are apparently available more frequently to more and more people these days for whatever reasons we don't know. And they seem to go in cycles. And uh, they tend to come in turbulent periods of time. Perhaps we are still evolving. It seems very possible that the brain, even now, has capabilities which are still untapped. Dr. Michael Graves is a neurologist in Los Angeles and is keenly aware of the bewildering complexity of the mind. How the brain actually works when we do something as simple as think or say a sentence is something that we know really very little about. As clinical neurologists, we know that certain parts of the brain can be destroyed and the individual doesn't suffer. So there are parts of the brain with no obvious, easily identifiable function, but I believe that there must be some function for all parts of the brain. Modern brain scans actually give you a picture that looks as if someone's head has been sliced into serial sections, just as like a, a loaf of bread is cut. This is a cross-section of the patient's brain 
the intensity of the color indicates the intensity of metabolism of the brain tissue. For example, here we see a red area in the temporal lobe of the brain. That's the part of the brain which is metabolizing or using energy the most intensely. Other areas are yellow or even blue. They are using energy less intensely. This technique could tell us what part of the brain is most intensively, intensely operating during any mental function, including telekinesis or any psychic phenomenon. Once we get that, that step is accomplished, there would still be unanswered questions as to how that part of the brain did that job. In Waterville, Maine, the Veyura family has confounded skeptics with their ability to capture ghost images on film. For 15 years, they have explored the natural hunting grounds of ghosts and have taken photographs that raise questions about man's true nature and the limits of our physical reality. Their odyssey began with a simple parlor game, which evolved into a dialogue with an entity that became their spirit guide. Richard Veyur records the sessions. Could you tell us how he passed away? A, C, C, I, D, E. Ouija first started in December of 1965, and it started as sort of a parlor game or as an amusement. F, R, I. The personality which introduced itself was ACL or Anne Caroline Lowe. She gave information concerning herself as to where she was buried, the inscription on her gravestone, location of cemetery, so forth. I have friend of uh, family. That's where I get out. Would it be possible to uh, photograph you? Yes. They were given the location of Anne Caroline Lowe's gravesite. With some trepidation, they visited the site and took this photograph of their young spirit guide. Though they photographed in a wide variety of situations, Researchers couldn't find any deception involved in their method. The personal reason to, to enter parapsychology was to determine the nature of the pictures and of the scripts. Is it possible to communicate with the deceased through Ouija? Is it possible to photograph the dead. Who is communicating? SD. Certain communicators would inform us that there is a return process from their so-called reality right. to come back into ours in order to communicate. No. They would have to pass through a tunnel or an alleyway. Okay. The opening at the beginning is very wide, and as they come closer to our own reality, it becomes narrower and narrower. They would see us as if steam vapor and water droplets would be falling on upon a piece of glass. Thoughtography and psychic photography or spirit photography or paranormal imagery. If you can't see the image, you're using a thoughtographic process. What we have to determine is what intelligence is producing the phenomenon. Is it our own unconscious or are we actually photographing uh, a deceased, and is that deceased thoughtographically impressing its image or another image upon our plate? In 1966, in Denver, Colorado, a series of tightly controlled experiments are conducted. Researchers are checking and numbering fresh film and new cameras. The subject of these experiments is Ted Sirios, a Chicago bellhop with an incredible mind and an incredible thirst to match. Ted Sirios' ability is the power to project his thoughts onto film. 
During the experiments, researchers take the pictures while Ted stares into the camera. His concentration is intense. His pulse rate rises to 120 or more. The results are staggering. Images of all kinds begin appearing on the film. A target photograph unseen by Ted and known to only two of the researchers is the image that Ted tries to duplicate. Sometimes, when he is sure he has the photograph, he shouts, I got it that time. An amazing aspect of the pictures is that they often contain small errors in form. They are not quite exact duplicates, like the inverted strut of this plane. It is as though that part of his brain that does these things can't make up its mind about the target picture. Again and again, he matches the target pictures until it is difficult to doubt that he is actually doing what he says he is. One of the most spectacular demonstrations of all takes place in a Colorado television station. In a moment of bravado, Ted claims that he can actually put images onto the videotape. Here are the results of that experiment. Convention tells us that this should not be possible. But if these images don't come from the mind of Ted Sirios, where do they come from? Images from the far reaches of our imagination. These ghostly faces look at us from behind the veil that hides the mysteries of life and death and make us wonder about the reality of ghosts.